The Dying of the Dragons, Rhaenyra Triumphant, Part 2. The how, and when, and why of what has become known as the treasons of Tumbleton remain a matter of much dispute, and the truth of all that happened will likely never be known. It does appear that certain of those who flooded into the town, fleeing before Lord Hightower's army, were actually part of that army, sent ahead to infiltrate the ranks of the defenders. Beyond question, two of the Blackwater men who had joined the River Lords on their march south, Lord Owain Borney and Sir Roger Corn, were secret supporters of King Egon II. Yet their betrayals would have counted for little, had not Sir Ulf White and Sir Hugh Hammer also chosen this moment to change their allegiance. Most of what we know of these men comes from Mushroom. The Dwarf is not reticent in his assessment of the low character of these two dragon riders, painting the former as a drunkard and the latter as a brute. Both were cravens, he tells us. It was only when they saw Lord Orman's host, with spear points glittering in the sun, and its line of march stretching back for long leagues that they decided to join him rather than oppose him. Yet neither man hesitated to face storms of spears and arrows off Driftmark. It may be that it was the thought of attacking Tessarion that gave them pause. In the gullet, all the dragons had been on their own side. This too may be possible, though both Vermithor and Silverwing were older and larger than Prince Darien's dragon, and would therefore have been more likely to prevail in any battle. Others suggest it was avarice, not cowardice, that led White and Hammer to betrayal. Honor meant little and less to them. It was wealth and power they lusted for. After the gullet and the fall of King's Landing, they had been granted knighthood, but they aspired to be lords and scorned the modest holdings bestowed on them by Queen Rhaenyra. When Lords Rosby and Stokeworth were executed, it was proposed that White and Hammer be given their lands and castles through marriage to their daughters, but Her Grace had allowed the traitor's sons to inherit instead. Then, Storm's End and Casterly Rock were dangled before them, but these rewards as well, the ungrateful queen had denied them. No doubt, they hoped that King Aegon II might reward them better, should they help return the Iron Throne to him. It might even be that certain promises were made to them in this regard, possibly through Lord Larry's the Clubfoot or one of his agents, though this remains unproven and unprovable. As neither man could read nor write, we shall never know what drove the two betrayers, as history has named them, to do what they did. Of the Battle of Tumbleton, we know much and more, however. Six thousand of the Queen's men formed up to face Lord Hightower in the field, under the command of Sir Garibald Grey. They fought bravely for a time, but a withering rain of arrows from Lord Ormond's archers thinned their ranks, and a thunderous charge by his heavy horse broke them, sending the survivors running back toward the town halls. There, Red Rob Rivers and his bowmen stood, covering the retreat with their own longbows. When most of the survivors were safe inside the gates, Roddy the Ruin and his winter wolves sallied forth from the postern gate, screaming their terrifying northern war cries as they swept around the left flank of the attackers. In the chaos that ensued, the Northmen fought their way through ten times their own number, to where Lord Ormond Hightower sat his warhorse beneath King Egon's golden dragon and the banners of Old Town and the Hightower. As the singers tell it, Lord Roderick was bloody from head to heel as he came on, with splintered shield and cracked helm, yet so drunk with battle that he did not even seem to feel his wounds. Sir Bryden Hightower, Lord Ormond's cousin, put himself between the Northmen and his liege, taking off the ruined shield arm at the shoulder with one terrible blow of his long axe. Yet, the savage lord of Barrowtown fought on, slaying both Sir Bryden and Lord Ormond before he died. Lord Hightower's banners toppled, and the townsfolk gave a great cheer, thinking the tide of battle turned. Even the appearance of Tessarion across the field did not dismay them, for they knew they had two dragons of their own. But when Vermithor and Silverwing climbed into the sky and loosed their fires upon Tumbleton, those cheers changed to screams.
It was the field of fire, writ small, Grandmaster Munkin wrote. Tumbleton went up in flame. Shops, homes, septs, people, all. Men fell burning from gatehouse and battlements, or stumbled, shrieking through the streets like so many living torches. Outside the walls, Prince Darien swooped down upon Tessarian. Pate of Longleaf was unhorsed and trampled. Sir Garibald Grey, pierced by a crossbow bolt, then engulfed by dragon flame. The two betrayers scourged the town with whips of flame from one end to the other. Sir Roger Corn and his men chose that moment to show their true colors, cutting down defenders on the town gates and throwing them open to the attackers. Lord Owain Burney did the same within the castle, driving a spear through the back of Sir Merrill the Bold. The sack that followed was as savage as any in the history of Westeros. Tumbleton, that prosperous market town, was reduced to ash and embers. Thousands burned, and as many died by drowning as they tried to swim the river. Some would later say they were the fortunate ones, for no mercy was shown to the survivors. Lord Footley's men threw down their swords and yielded, only to be bound and beheaded. Old men and boys were put to the sword, whilst the dragons fed upon the twisted, smoking carcasses of their victims. Tumbleton was never to recover, though later, Footlease would attempt to rebuild atop the ruins. Their new town would never be a tenth the size of the old town, for the small folk said the very ground was haunted. 160 leagues to the north, other dragons soared above the trident, where Prince Daemon Targaryen and the small brown girl called Nettles were hunting Aemon One-Eye without success. They had based themselves at Maidenpool, at the invitation of Lord Manfred Moonton, who lived in terror of Vagar descending on his town. Instead, Prince Aemon struck at Stony Head, in the foothills of the Mountains of the Moon, at Sweet Willow, on the Green Fork, and Sally Dance, on the Red Fork. He reduced Bowshot Bridge to embers, burned Old Ferry and Crone's Mill, destroyed the Mother House at Betchter, always vanishing back into the sky before the hunters could arrive. Vagar never lingered, nor did the survivors oft agree on which way the dragon had flown. Each dawn, Seraxes and Sheepstealer flew from Maidenpool, climbing high above the riverlands in ever-widening circles in hopes of espying Vagar below, only to return defeated at dusk. The chroniclers of Maidenpool tell us Lord Moonton made so bold as to suggest that the dragon riders divide their search so as to cover twice the ground. Prince Daemon refused. Vagar was the last of the three dragons that had come to Westeros with Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters, he reminded his lordship, though slower than she had been a century before. She had grown nigh as large as the Black Dread of old. Her fires burned hot enough to melt stone, and neither Seraxes nor Sheepstealer could match her ferocity. Only together could they hope to withstand her, and so he kept the girl Nettles by his side, day and night, in sky and castle. Yet was fear of Vagar the only reason Prince Daemon kept Nettles close to him? Mushroom would have us believe it was not. By the dwarf's account, Daemon Targaryen had come to love the small brown bastard girl and had taken her into his bed. How much credence can we give the fool's testimony? Nettles was no more than ten and seven, Prince Daemon nine and forty. Yet the power young maidens exert over older men is well known. Daemon Targaryen was not a faithful consort to the queen, we know. Even our normally reticent Septim Eustace writes of his nightly visits to Lady Myceria, whose bed he oft shared whilst at court, with the queen's blessing, purportedly. Nor should it be forgotten that during his youth, every brothel keeper in King's Landing knew that Lord Fleabottom took an especial delight in maidens, and kept aside the youngest, prettiest, and more innocent of their new girls for him to deflower. The girl Nettles was young beyond a doubt, though perhaps not as young as those the prince had debauched in his youth. But it seemed doubtful that she was a true maiden, growing up homeless, motherless, and penniless on the streets of Spice Town and Hull, she would most likely have surrendered her innocence not long after her first flowering, if not before. In return for half a groat or a crust of bread and the sheep she fed to Sheepstealer to bind him to her. 
How would she have come by those, if not by lifting her skirts, for some shepherd? Nor could Nettie truly be called pretty, a skinny brown girl on a skinny brown dragon, writes Munkin in his true telling, though he never saw her. Septim Eustace says her teeth were crooked, her nose scarred where it had once been slit for thieving. Hardly a likely paramour for a prince, one would think. Against that, we have the testimony of Mushroom, and in this case, the Chronicles of Maidenpool, as set down by Lord Mouton's maester, Maester Norrin writes that the prince and his bastard girl supped together every night, broke their fast together every morning, slept in adjoining bedchambers, that the prince doted upon the brown girl as a man might dote upon his daughter, instructing her in common courtesies and how to dress and sit and brush her hair, that he made gifts to her of an ivory-handled hairbrush, a silvered looking glass, a cloak of rich brown velvet bordered in satin, a pair of riding boots of leather soft as butter. The prince taught the girl to wash, Norrin says, and the maidservants who fetched their bath water said he oft shared a tub with her, quote, soaping her back or washing the dragon stink from her hair, both of them as naked as their name days. None of these constitutes proof that Daemon Targaryen had carnal knowledge of the bastard girl, but in light of what followed, we must surely judge that more likely than most of Mushroom's tales. Yet, however these dragon riders spent their nights, it is a certainty that their days were spent prowling the skies, hunting after Prince Aemond and Vagar without success. So let us leave them for the nonce, and turn our gaze briefly across Blackwater Bay. It was about this time that a battered merchant cog named Nessaria came limping into the harbor beneath Dragonstone to make repairs and take on provisions. She had been returning from Pentos to Old Volantis when a storm drove her off course, her crew said. But to this common song of peril at sea, the Volantines added a queer note. As Nasseria beat westward, the dragon mount loomed up before them, huge against the setting sun, and the sailors spied two dragons fighting, their roars echoing off the sheer black cliffs of the smoking mountain's eastern flanks. In every tavern, inn, and whorehouse along the waterfront, the tale was told, retold, and embroidered till every man on Dragonstone had heard it. Dragons were a wonder to the men of old Volantis. The sight of two in battle was one the men of Nasaria would never forget. Those born and bred on Dragonstone had grown up with such beasts. Yet, even so, the sailor's story excited interest. The next morning, some local fisherfolk took their boats around the Dragon Mount and returned to report seeing the burned and broken remains of a dead dragon at the mountain's base. From the color of its wings and scales, the carcass was that of Grey Ghost. The dragon lay in two pieces, and had been torn apart and partially devoured. On hearing this news, Sir Robert Quince, the amiable and famous obese knight whom the Queen had named Castilian of Dragonstone upon her departure, was quick to name the cannibal as the killer. Most agreed, for the cannibal had been known to attack smaller dragons in the past, though seldom so savagely. Some amongst the fisherfolk, fearing that the killer might turn upon them next, urged Quince to dispatch knights to the beast's lair to put an end to him, but the Castilian refused. If we do not trouble him, the cannibal will not trouble us, he declared. To be certain of that, he forbade fishing in the waters beneath the dragon mount's eastern face, where the vanquished dragon's body lay rotting. His decree did not satisfy his restless charge. Bela Targaryen, Prince Daemon's daughter by his second wife, Leanna Valerian. At ten and four, Bela was a wild and willful young maiden, more boyish than ladylike, and very much her father's daughter. Though slim and short of stature, she knew not of fear, and lived to dance and hawk and ride. As a younger girl, she had oft been chastised for wrestling with squires in the yard, but of late, she had taken to playing kissing games with them instead. Not long after, the Queen's court removed to King's Landing, whilst leaving Lady Bela on Dragonstone. Bela had been caught allowing a kitchen scullion to slip his hand inside her jerkin. Sir Robert, 
outraged, had sent the boy to the block to have the offending hand removed. Only the girl's tearful intercession had saved him. She is overly fond of boys, the Castilian wrote Bela's father, Prince Damon after the incident, and should be married soon, lest she surrender her virtue to someone unworthy of her. Even more than boys, however, Lady Bela loved to fly. Since first riding her dragon, Moon Dancer, into the sky not half a year past, she had flown every day, ranging freely to every part of Dragonstone and even across the sea to Driftmark. Always eager for adventure, the girl now proposed to find the truth of what had happened on the other side of the mountain for herself. She had no fear of the cannibal, she told Sir Robert. Moondancer was younger and faster. She could easily outfly the other dragon. But the Castilian forbade her taking any such risk. The garrison was given strict instructions. Lady Bela was not to leave the castle. When caught attempting to defy his command that very night, the angry maiden was confined to her chambers. Though understandable, this proved, in hindsight, to be unfortunate, for had Lady Bela been allowed to fly, she might have spied the fishing boat that was even then making its way around the island. Aboard was an aged fisherman called Tom Tanglebeard, his son, Tom Tangleton, and his two, quote, cousins from Driftmark, left homeless when Spicetown was destroyed. The younger Tom, as handy with a tankard as he was clumsy with a net, had spent a deal of time buying drinks for Volantine sailors and listening to their accounts of the dragons they had seen fighting. Grey and gold they was, flashing in the sun, one man said. And now, in defiance of Sir Robert's prohibition, the two Toms were intent on delivering their cousins to the stony strand where the dead dragon sprawled, burned, and broken, so they might seek after his slayer. Meanwhile, on the western shore of Blackwater Bay, word of battle and betrayal at Tumbleton had reached King's Landing. It is said, the Dowager Queen Alicent laughed when she heard, All they have sowed, now they shall reap, she promised. On the Iron Throne, Queen Rhaenyra grew pale and faint, and ordered the city gates closed and barred. Henceforth, no one was allowed to enter or leave King's Landing. I will have no turncloak stealing into my city to open my gates to rebels, she proclaimed. Lord Ormond's host could be outside their walls by the morrow or the day after. The betrayers, Dragonborn, could arrive even sooner than that. This prospect excited Prince Joffrey. Let them come, the boy announced, flush with the arrogance of youth and eager to avenge his fallen brothers. I will meet them on Tyraxes. Such talk alarmed his mother. You will not, she declared. You are too young for battle. Even so, she allowed the boy to remain as the Black Council discussed how best to deal with the approaching foe. Six dragons remained in King's Landing, but only one within the walls of the Red Keep, the Queen's own she-dragon, Cyrax. A stable in the Outer Ward had been emptied of horses and given over for her use. Heavy chains bound her to the ground. Though long enough to allow her to move from stable to yard, the chains kept her from flying off riderless. Cyrax had long grown accustomed to the chains. Exceedingly well fed, she had not hunted for years. The other dragons were kept in the dragon pit, beneath its great dome. Forty huge undervaults had been carved from the bones of the hill of Rhaenys in a great ring. Thick iron doors closed these man-made caves at either end, the inner doors fronting on the sands of the pit, the outer openings to the hillside. Saraxes, Vermithor, Silverwing, and Sheepstealer had made their lairs there before flying off to battle. Five dragons remained, Prince Joffrey's Tyraxes, Adam Valerian's Pale Grey Sea Smoke, the young dragons Morgul and Shrykos, bound to Princess Jehera, fled, and her twin, Prince Jeharis, dead, and Dreamfire, beloved of Queen Helena. It had long been the custom for at least one dragon rider to reside at the pit, so as to be able to rise to the defense of the city should the need arise. As Rhaenyra preferred to keep her sons by her side, that duty fell to Adam Valerian. 
But now, voices on the Black Council were raised to question Sir Adam's loyalty. The Dragon Seeds, Ulf White, and Hugh Hammer had gone over to the enemy, but were they the only traitors in their midst? What of Adam of Hull and the girl Nettles? They had been born of bastard stock as well. Could they be trusted? Lord Bartimos Keltigar thought not. Bastards are treacherous by nature, he said. It is in their blood. Betrayal comes as easily to a bastard as loyalty to true-born men. He urged her grace to have the two base-born dragon riders seized immediately, before they too could join the enemy with their dragons. Others echoed his views. Amongst them, Sir Luther Largent, commander of her city watch, and Sir Laurent Marbrand, lord commander of her queen's guard. Even the two White Harbor men, that fearsome knight Sir Medric Manderley, and his clever, corpulent brother Sir Torin, urged the Queen to mistrust. Bus take no chances, Sir Torin said. If the foe gains two more dragons, we are lost. Only Lord Corliss and Grand Maester Girardi spoke in defense of the dragon seeds. The Grand Maester said that they had no proof of any disloyalty on the parts of Nettles and Sir Adam. The path of wisdom was to seek such proof before making any judgments. Lord Corliss went much further, declaring that Sir Adam and his brother, Alan, were, quote, true Valerians, worthy heirs to Driftmark. As for the girl, though she might be dirty and ill-favored, she had fought valiantly in the Battle of the Gullet. As did the two betrayers, Lord Keltigar countered. The Hand's impassioned protests and the Grand Maester's cool caution both proved to be in vain. The Queen's suspicions had been aroused. Her grace had been betrayed so often, by so many, that she was quick to believe the worst of any man. Septim Eustace writes, Treachery no longer had the power to surprise her. She had come to expect it even from those she loved the most. It might be so, yet Queen Rhaenyra did not act at once, but rather sent for Mycerea, the harlot and dancing girl, who was named her Mistress of Whispers in all but name, with her skin as pale as milk. Lady Misery appeared before the council in a hooded robe of black velvet lined with blood-red silk, and stood with head bowed, humbly, as her grace asked whether she thought Sir Adam and Nettles might be planning to betray them. Then, the white worm raised her eyes and said in a soft voice, The girl has already betrayed you, my queen. Even now she shares your husband's bed, and soon enough she will have his bastard in her belly. Then, Queen Rhaenyra grew most wroth, Septim Eustace writes. In a voice as cold as ice, she commanded Sir Luther Largent to take twenty gold cloaks to the dragon pit and arrest Sir Adam Valerian. Question him sharply, and we will learn if he is true or false, beyond a doubt. As to the girl Nettles, she is a common thing, with the stink of sorcery upon her, the queen declared. My prince would ne'er lay with such a low creature. You need only to look at her, to know she has no drop of dragon's blood in her. It was with spells that she bound a dragon to her. And she has done the same with my lord husband. So long as he was in the girl's thrall, Prince Damon could not be relied upon, her grace went on. Therefore, let a command be sent at once to Maidenpool, but only for the eyes of Lord Moonton. Let him take her at table, or a bed, and strike her head off. Only then shall my prince be freed. And thus did betrayal beget more betrayal, to the queen's undoing. As Sir Luther Largent rode up Rhaenys's hill, with the queen's warrant, the doors of the dragon pit were thrown open above them, and sea smoke spread his pale gray wings, and took flight, smoke rising from his nostrils. Sir Adam Valerian had been forewarned in time to make his escape. Balked and angry, Sir Luthor returned at once to the Red Keep, where he burst into the Tower of the Hand and laid rough hands on the aged Lord Corliss, accusing him of treachery. Nor did the old man deny it. Bound and beaten, but still silent, he was taken down into the dungeons and thrown into a black cell to await trial and execution. 
The Queen's suspicion fell upon Grand Maester Girardi's as well, for like the sea snake, he had defended the dragon seeds. Girardi's denied having any part in Lord Corliss's betrayal. Mindful of his long, leal service to her, Rhaenyra spared the Grand Maester the dungeons, but chose instead to dismiss him from her council and send him back to Dragonstone at once. I do not think you would lie to my face, she told Girardi's. But I cannot have men around me that I do not trust implicitly, and when I look at you, now all I can recall is how you prated at me about this Nettles girl. All the while, tales of the slaughter at Tumbleton were spreading through the city, and with them, terror. King's Landing would be next, men told one another. Dragon would fight dragon, and this time, the city would surely burn. Fearful of the coming foe, Hundreds tried to flee, only to be turned back at the gates by the gold cloaks. Trapped within the city walls, some sought shelter in deep cellars against the firestorm they feared was coming, whilst others turned to prayer, to drink, and to pleasures to be found between a woman's thighs. By nightfall, the city's taverns, brothels, and septs were full to bursting with men and women seeking solace or escape and trading tales of terror. "'Twas in this dark hour that there rose up, in Cobbler Square, a certain itinerant brother, a barefoot scarecrow of a man, in a hair shirt and rough-spun breeches, filthy and unwashed and smelling of the sty, with a begging bowl hung round his neck on a leather thong. A thief he had been, for where his right hand should have been was only a stump covered by ragged leather. Grand Maester Munkin suggests he might have been a poor fellow. Though that order had long been outlawed, wandering stars still haunted the byways of the Seven Kingdoms. Where he came from, we cannot know. Even his name is lost to history. Those who heard him preach, like those who would later record his infamy, knew him only as the Shepherd. Mushroom names him the Dead Shepherd, for he claims the man was as pale and foul as a corpse fresh risen from its grave. Whoever or whatever he might have been, this one-handed shepherd rose up like some malign spirit, calling down doom and destruction on Queen Rhaenyra to all who came to hear. As tireless as he was fearless, he preached all night and well into the following day, his angry voice ringing across Cobbler's Square. Dragons were unnatural creatures, the shepherd declare, Demons, summoned from the pits of the seven hells by the fell sorceries of Valeria. That vile cesspit, where brother lay with sister and mother with son, where men rode demons into battle, whilst their women spread their legs for dogs. The Targaryens had escaped the doom, fleeing across the seas to dragonstones, but, quote, the gods are not mocked, and now a second doom was at hand. The false king and the whore queen shall be cast down with all their works, and their demon beasts shall perish from the earth. The shepherd thundered. All those who stood with them would die as well. Only by cleansing King's Landing of dragons and their masters could Westeros hope to avoid the fate of Valeria. Each hour his crowd grew. A dozen listeners became a score and then a hundred, and by break of dawn thousands were crowding into the square, shoving and pushing as they strained to hear. Many clutched torches, and by nightfall the shepherd stood amidst a ring of fire. Those who tried to shout him down were savaged by the crowd. Even the gold cloaks were driven off when forty of them attempted to clear the square at spear point. A different sort of chaos reigned in Tumbleton, sixty leagues to the southwest. Whilst King's Landing quailed in terror, the foes they feared had yet to advance a foot towards the city. For King Aegon's loyalists found themselves leaderless, beset by division, conflict, and doubt. Ormond Hightower lay dead, along with his cousin, Sir Brynden, the foremost knight of Old Town. His sons remained back at Hightower, a thousand leagues away. 
and were green boys besides. And whilst Lord Ormond had dubbed Darien Targaryen, Darien the Daring, and praised his courage in battle, the prince was still a boy, the youngest of Queen Alicent's sons. He had grown up in the shadow of his elder brothers, and was more used to following commands than giving them. The most senior Hightower remaining with the host was Sir Hobart, another of Lord Ormond's cousins, hitherto entrusted only with the baggage train. A man as stout as he was slow. Hobart Hightower had lived sixty years without distinguishing himself, yet now he presumed to take command of the host by right of his kinship to Queen Alicent. Lord Unwin Peake, Sir John Roxton the Bold, and Lord Owain Borney stepped forward as well. Lord Peake could boast descent from a long line of famous warriors, and had a hundred knights and nine hundred men-at-arms beneath his banners. John Roxton was as feared for his black temper as for his black blade, the Valerian steel sword called Orphan Maker. Lord Owain the Betrayer insisted that his cunning had won them Tumbleton, and that only he could take King's Landing. None of the claimants was powerful and respected enough to curb the bloodlust and avarice of the common soldiers. Whilst they squabbled over precedence and plunder, their own men joined freely in the orgy of looting, rape, and destruction. The horrors of those days cannot be gainsaid. Seldom has any town or city in the history of the Seven Kingdoms been subject to as long or as cruel or as savage a sack as Tumbleton after the treasons. Without a strong lord to restrain them, even good men can turn to beasts. So was it here. Bands of soldiers wandered drunkenly through the streets, robbing every home and shop, and slaying any man who tried to stay their hands. Every woman was fair prey for their lust, even crones and little girls. Wealthy men were tortured unto death to force them to reveal where they had hidden their gold and gems. Babes were torn from their mother's arms and impaled upon the points of spears. Holy septas were chased naked through the streets and defiled. Not by one man, but by a hundred. Silent sisters were violated. Even dead were not spared. Instead of being given honorable burial, their corpses were left to rot fodder for the carrion, crows, and wild dogs. Septim Eustace and Grand Maester Munkin both assert that Prince Darien was sickened by all he saw and commanded Sir Hobart Hightower to put a stop to it. But Hightower's efforts proved as ineffectual as the man himself. It is in the nature of small folk to follow where their lords lead, and Lord Ormond's would-be successors had themselves fallen victim to avarice, bloodlust, and pride. Bold John Roxton became enamored of the beautiful Lady Sharis Footley, the wife of the Lord of Tumbleton, and claimed her as a prize of war. When her lord husband protested, Sir John cut him nigh in two with Orphan Maker, saying, She can make widows, too, as he tore the gown from the weeping Lady Sharis. Only two days later, Lord Peak and Lord Burney argued bitterly at a war council until Peak drew his dagger and stabbed Borney through the eye, declaring, once a turncloak, ever a turncloak, as Prince Darien and Sir Hobart looked on, horror-struck. Yet the worst crimes were those committed by the two betrayers, the base-born dragon riders Hugh Hammer and Ulf White. Sir Ulf gave himself over entirely to drunkenness, drowning himself in wine and flesh. Mushroom says he despoiled three maidens every night. Those who failed to please were fed to his dragon. The knighthood that Queen Rhaenyra had conferred on him did not suffice. Nor was he surfeit when Prince Darien named him Lord of Bitterbridge. White had a greater prize in mind. He desired no less a seat than High Garden, declaring that the Tyrells had played no part in the dance and therefore should be attained as traitors. Sir Ulf's ambitions must be accounted modest when compared to those of his fellow turncloak, Hugh Hammer. The son of a common blacksmith, Hammer was a huge man, with hands so strong that he was said to be able to twist steel bars into torques. Though largely untrained in the art of war, his size and strength made him a fearsome foe. His weapon of choice was the Warhammer, with which he delivered crushing, killing blows. In battle, he rode Vermithor, once the mount of the old king himself. Of all the dragons in Westeros, 
only Vagar was older or larger. For all these reasons, Lord Hammer, as he now styled himself, began to dream of crowns. Why be a lord when you can be a king? He told the men who began to gather round him, and talk was heard in a camp of prophecy of ancient days that said, When the hammer shall fall upon the dragon, a new king shall arise, and none shall stand before him. Whence came these words remains a mystery. Not from Hammer himself, who could neither read nor write, but within a few days every man at Tumbleton had heard them. Neither of the two betrayers seemed eager to help Prince Darien press an attack on King's Landing. They had a great host, and three dragons besides, yet the Queen had three dragons as well, as best they knew and would have five once Prince Damon returned with nettles. Lord Peak preferred to delay any advance until Lord Baratheon could bring up his power from Storm's End to join them, whilst Sir Hobart wished to fall back to the Reach to replenish their fast dwindling supplies. None seemed concerned that their army was shrinking every day, melting away like morning dew as more and more men deserted, stealing off for home and harvest with all the plunder they could carry. Long leagues to the north, in a castle overlooking the Bay of Crabs, another lord found himself sliding down a sword's edge as well. From King's Landing came a raven bearing the Queen's message to Mouton, Lord of Maidenpool. He was to deliver her the head of the bastard girl Nettles, who had been judged guilty of high treason. No harm is to be done to my lord husband, Prince Damon of House Targaryen, her grace commanded. Send him back to me when the deed is done, for we have urgent need of him. Maester Norin, keeper of the Chronicles of Maidenpool, says that when his lordship read the Queen's letter, he was so shaken that he lost his voice, nor did it return to him until he had drunk three cups of wine. Thereupon Lord Mouton sent for the captain of his guard, his brother, and his champion, Sir Florian Greysteel. He bade his maester to remain as well. When all had assembled, he read to them the letter and asked them for their counsel. This thing is easily done, said the captain of his guard. The prince sleeps beside her, but he has grown old. Three men should be enough to subdue him, should he try to interfere, but I will take six to be certain. Does my lordship wish it done tonight? Six men, or sixty, he is still Damon Targaryen. Lord Mouton's brother objected. A sleeping draught in his evening wine would be the wiser course. Let him wake to find her dead. The girl is but a child, however foul her treasons, said Sir Florian, that old knight, grey and grizzled and stern. The old king would have never asked this of any man of honor. These are foul times, Lord Moonton said, and it is a foul choice this queen has given me. The girl is a guest beneath my roof. If I obey, Maidenpool shall be forever cursed. If I refuse... We shall be attained and destroyed. To which his brother answered, It might be we shall be destroyed whatever choice we make. The prince is more than fond of this brown girl, and his dragon is close at hand. A wise lord would kill them both, lest the prince burn Maidenpool in his wrath. The queen forbade any harm come to him, Lord Moonton reminded them, and murdering two guests in their bed is twice as foul as murdering one. I should be doubly cursed. Thereupon he sighed and said, Would that I have never read this letter. And up spoke Maester Norin, saying, Mayhaps you never did. What was said after that, the Chronicles of Maidenpool do not tell us. All we know is that the Maester, a young man of two and twenty, found Prince Damon and the girl Nettles at their supper that night, and showed them the Queen's letter. Weary, after a long day of fruitless flight, they were sharing a simple meal of boiled beef and beets when I entered, talking softly with one another. Of what, I cannot say. The prince greeted me politely, but as he read, I saw the joy go from his eyes, and a sadness descended upon him, like a weight too heavy to be borne. When the girl asked what was in the letter, he said, A queen's words, a whore's work. Then he drew his sword and asked if Lord Mouton's men were waiting outside to take them captive. I came alone, I told him, then, forswore myself, declaring falsely that neither his lordship nor any other man of Maidenpool knew what was written on the parchment. Forgive me, my prince, I said. I have broken my maester's vows. Prince Damon sheathed his sword, saying, 
you are a bad maester, but a good man. After which he bade me leave them, commanding me to speak no word of this to lord nor love until the morrow. How the prince and his bastard girl spent their last night beneath Lord Mouton's roof is not recorded, but as dawn broke, they appeared together in the yard, and Prince Damon helped Nettles saddle Sheepstealer one last time. It was her custom to feed him each day before she flew. Dragons bend easier to their rider's will when full. That morning, she fed him a black ram, the largest in all Maidenpool slitting the ram's throat herself. Her riding leathers were stained with blood when she mounted her dragon, Maester Norrin records, and her cheeks were stained with tears. No word of farewell was spoken betwixt man and maid, but as Sheepstealer beat his leathery brown wings and climbed into the dawn sky, Saraxes raised his head and gave a scream that shattered every window in Jonquil's tower. High above the town, Nettles turned her dragon toward the Bay of Crabs, and vanished in the morning mists, never to be seen again at court or castle. Damon Targaryen returned to the castle just long enough to break his fast with Lord Mouton. This is the last you will see of me, he told his lordship. I thank you for your hospitality. Let it be known through all your lands that I fly for Harrenhal. If my nephew Aemon dares face me, he shall find me there, alone. Thus, Prince Damon departed Maidenpool for the last time, when he was gone, Maester Norrin went to his lord to say, Take the chain from my neck and bind my hands in it. You must needs deliver me to the queen. When I gave warning to a traitor and allowed her to escape, I became a traitor as well. Lord Mouton refused. Keep your chain, his lordship said. We are all traitors here. And that night, Queen Rhaenyra's quartered banners were taken down from where they flew above the gates of Maidenpool, and the golden dragons of King Aegon II raised in their stead. No banners flew above the blackened towers and ruined keeps of Harrenhal when Prince Daemon descended from the sky to claim the castle for his own. A few squatters had found shelter in the castle's deep vaults and undercellars, but the sound of Saraxi's wings sent them fleeing. When the last of them was gone, Daemon Targaryen walked to the cavernous halls of Harren's seat alone, with no companion but his dragon. Each night at dusk he slashed the heart tree in the godswood to mark the passing of another day. Thirteen marks can be seen upon that weirwood still. Old wounds, deep and dark. Yet the lords who have ruled Harrenhal since Daemon's day say they bleed afresh every spring. On the fourteenth day of the prince's vigil, a shadow swept over the castle, blacker than any passing cloud. All the birds in the godswood took to the air in fright and a hot wind whipped the fallen leaves across the yard. Vagar had come at last, and on her back rode the one-eyed prince, Aemon Targaryen, clad in night-black armor, chased with gold. He had not come alone. Alice Rivers flew with him, her long hair streaming black behind her, her belly swollen with child. Prince Aemon circled twice about the towers of Harrenhal, then brought Vagar down in the outer ward, with Saraxes a hundred yards away. The dragons glared balefully at one another, and Saraxes spread his wings and hissed, flames dancing across his teeth. The prince helped his woman down from Vagar's back, then turned to face his uncle. Uncle, I heard you have been seeking us. Only you, Damon replied, who told you where to find me. My lady, Aemon answered. She saw you in a storm cloud, in a mountain pool at dusk, in the fire we lit to cook our suppers. She sees much and more, my Alice. You were a fool to come alone. Were I not alone, you would not have come, said Damon. Yet you are, and here I am. You have lived too long, Uncle. On that we agree, Damon replied. Then the old prince bade Saraxes bend his neck, and climbed stiffly onto his back, whilst the young prince kissed his woman and vaulted lightly onto Vagar, taking care to fasten the four short chains between belt and saddle. Damon left his own chains dangling. Saraxes hissed again, filling the air with flame, and Vagar answered with a roar. As one, the two dragons leapt into the sky. Prince Damon took Saraxes up swiftly, lashing him with a steel-tipped whip until they disappeared into a bank of clouds. Vagar, 
older, and much the larger, was also slower, made ponderous by her very size, and ascended more gradually, in ever-widening circles that took her and her rider out over the waters of the god's eye. The hour was late, the sun was close to setting, and the lake was calm, its surface glimmering like a sheet of beaten copper. Up and up she soared, searching for Syraxes as Alice Rivers watched from atop King Pyre Tower in Harren Hall below. The attack came sudden as a thunderbolt. Syraxes dove down upon Vagar with a piercing shriek that was heard a dozen miles away. Cloaked by the glare of the setting sun on Prince Aemon's blind side, the bloodworms slammed into the older dragon with terrible force. Their roars echoed across the god's eye as the two grappled and tore at one another, dark against a blood-red sky. So bright did their flames burn that fisher folk below feared the clouds themselves had caught fire. Locked together, the dragons tumbled towards the lake. The blood worm's jaws closed around Vagar's neck, her black teeth sinking deep into the flesh of the larger dragon. Even as Vagar's claws raked his belly open, and Vagar's own teeth ripped away a wing, Syraxes bit deeper, worrying at the wound as the lake rushed up below them with terrible speed. And it was then, the tale tells us, that Prince Daemon Targaryen swung a leg over his saddle and leapt from one dragon to the other. In his hand was Dark Sister, the sword of Queen Visenya. As Aemon One-Eye looked up in terror, fumbling with the chains that bound him to his saddle, Daemon ripped off his nephew's helm and drove the sword down into his blind eye. So hard the point came out the back of the young prince's throat. Half a heartbeat later, the dragon struck the lake, sending up a gout of water that was said to have been as tall as King Pyre Tower. Neither man nor dragon could have survived such an impact. The fisherfolk who saw it said, nor did they. Syraxes lived long enough to crawl back onto the land, gutted, with one wing torn from his body, and the waters of the lake smoking about him. The bloodworm found the strength to drag himself onto the lake shore, expiring beneath the walls of Harren Hall. Vagar's carcass plunged to the lake floor, the hot blood from the gaping wound in her neck, bringing the water to a boil over her last resting place. When she was found some years later, after the end of the Dance of the Dragons, Prince Aemon's armored bones remained chained to her saddle, with Dark Sister thrust hilt deep through his eye socket. That Prince Daemon died as well, we cannot doubt. His remains were never found, but there are queer currents in that lake, and hungry fish as well. The singers tell us that Old Prince survived the fall, and afterward made his way back to the girl Nettles, to spend the remainder of his days at her side. Such stories make for charming songs, but poor history. Even Mushroom gives the tale no credence, nor shall we. It was upon the 22nd day of the fifth moon of the year 130 AC when the dragons danced and died above the god's eye. Daemon Targaryen was nine and forty at his death. Prince Aemond had only turned twenty. Vagar, the greatest of the Targaryen dragons since the passing of Balerion the Black Dread, had counted 181 years upon the earth. Thus passed the last living creature from the days of Aegon's conquest, as dusk and darkness swallowed Black Harren's accursed seat. Yet so few were on hand to bear witness that it would be some time before word of Prince Daemon's last battle became widely known. Aemond and Daemon fighting seemed much an inevitability, both being the main dragon riding fighting heads of each side of the conflict. A set piece battle between the two seemed like it was bound to happen, but the circumstances in which this arrived, I have to say, came as quite the surprise from me. While the curse that Rhaenyra is under was hinted at in the last chapter with the Iron Throne scorning her, and touched on more in the beginning of this chapter, the fact that she would turn on Daemon, or at least Nettles, which Daemon was very close to, definitely came as a surprise to me, but it further strikes forth the comparison that was made to Magor, how there was the Mistress of Whispers who told of some kind of betrayal, which led to, albeit indirectly, the death of the ruling power's spouse. 
I think it might also be safe to say that not only Rhaenyra is cursed, but to a greater extent the Targaryen bloodline and maybe even Westeros. Jaehaerys' reign was by far the most stability Westeros had seen in quite a long time, and that had carried over into Viserys' rule, but mostly because Jaehaerys was such a good king. And with the way that the story seems to progress, it seems like the Targaryen bloodline is almost destined to these sorts of calamities. Especially exemplified by Tumbleton, the effects that the war is having on the land is absolutely dreadful. There is just ruin and destruction and disorder as far as the eye can see. And we are nearing the end of this conflict. Most of the big players have been taken out, and we are whittled down to Rhaenyra still having King's Landing, but Aegon II, along with Larry Strong and a few other characters, are still at large. With Aemond out of the picture, that only really leaves the disordered host in Tumbleton to oppose Rhaenyra. So it's going to be interesting to see how the story progresses with that in mind. Let me know what you guys think of the chapter. Is Rhaenyra a second Magor? And do you think that, as a whole, the Targaryen bloodline is carrying some sort of curse? Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate it, like always, and I'll be seeing you next week.